En hier bij Stanley Meijer, nu buiten zijn garage. En uh, we hebben net zijn uh, water-powered auto naar buiten gereden. Waar er nu wat over gediscussieerd wordt. En uh, er zijn dingen aan gewijzigd en zo. Dus ja, hij kan op het moment niet lopen, maar we mogen hem dus wel helemaal bekijken. Explain how this thing okay, works. Yeah, can you zoom in back in here? Yeah. Are we on? Okay. Okay, yeah. okay now this is the, uh, you want to hide the, the computer system, which was designed uh, in order to be able to process the fuel to produce the hydrogen gas from water and do it economically and be able to control its firing, going to the engine to allow the uh, uh, the Volkswagen engine to run uh, off of uh, hydrogen. There's a lot of uh, uh, engineering design that went into this, even though that this is our, uh, our systems engineering approach. Uh, the hydrogen computer system you see here will be miniaturized down to several uh, IC chips, which will allow us uh, to give the economics uh, to apply to a conventional car. Over here, uh, there's very unique design features uh, that had to be developed in order to uh, develop the water fuel cell as a, a retrofit energy system to conventional cars. Um, we had to go ahead and de uh, develop the laser, what we call the laser distributor, as you see right here, which is put between the conventional uh, rotor cap and that of the rotor assembly. And primarily what this does, this sets up the electronic uh, signals that goes back and triggers the computer system in order to allow uh, the car to run successfully on hydrogen. Uh, in order to run this uh, engine off of uh, water, we've also had to learn the ability to adjust the burn rate of hydrogen to co-equal the fossil fuels. We did this by simply now uh, pulling off a portion of the exhaust gas that's coming from the engine, as you see through this tube here, that's going through this electronic regulator that's hooked up to the hydrogen computer. And basically what's happening is that as the ambient air is going into the engine and going through the burning process, it produces the non-combustible gases that retards the speed by which the oxygen atom unites the hydrogen and bring on gas ignition. So by simply using the, the non-combustible gases coming from the exhaust of the engine, we now modulate and control the speed by which that oxygen unites with the hydrogen, and therefore we are adjusting the burn rate of hydrogen to co-equal that of gasoline or, or, or fossil fuels or even diesel fuel. And that gave us the number one uh, retrofit capabilities of retrofitting the water fuel cell technology to an existing engine. And we do this electronically. The unit that you see right here, we call this a gas processor. And basically what we're doing is we're ionizing the ambient air gases that are now going into the process. And this allows us 
to trigger and use the hydrogen fracturing technology and tapping into a higher energy yield coming from the hydrogen. The units you see right here, this is referred to as a resonant cavity. Uh, water is now fed into the resonant cavity through this water tank, and as such, we now expose the water to a very high intense pulse voltage field and restrict the amps, and therefore the electrical polarization process now allows us to release the hydrogen economically from water. And by attenuating the uh, voltage field, uh, the amplitude of the voltage field, we now can control the rate of the production of the hydrogen gas of demand. So this is what's called, referred to as a constant demand generator. We also now extend or allow the voltage amplitude to increase even to a higher level and allow the, uh, the water uh, atoms to go into a, an ionization state which gives us the ability even to produce a higher energy yield uh, by producing more hydrogen gas uh, on demand. So the fuel now coming from the water uh, through the electrical polarization process going into resonance, resonance meaning that we're actually tuning into the dielectric properties of water and allows us to reduce amps down, flow down to a minimum and allow voltage to take over to disassociate the water molecule on demand. And those fuel gases are now coming through this uh, electronic injector system as you see here. So basically we're now feeding uh, the ionized air from the, uh, the gas processor. We're now also taking the, the water fuel gases that are now coming from ordinary water. We are now mixing it with the non-combustible gases, the AME air gases, and regulating those uh, control of the fluid mediums or four fluid mediums. And as a result now we can uh, tune in and allow this engine to run off of natural water. This system's approach, uh, this particular unit here is referred to as the VIC or the Voltage uh, Intensified Circuit uh, Technology. Uh, this is being miniaturized down to a very small lightweight uh, system. Uh, on a, this is demonstrated in our systems engineering approach on the technology that we can apply it to other uh, applications, uh, not only in the transportation area but also in industrial applications. So it was paramount that we would uh, demonstrate and have the technology solved for design engineering retrofitting uh, to existing energy consuming devices whether it's, whether it's uh, being run an internal combustion engine or a diesel engine or hook it to an industrial process. So all of these um, design interfacing uh, technology is now being solved. We are in the latter stages of what we call the pre-engineering system uh, which will now allow us to miniaturize the technology uh, once we are completed on the design applications uh, and take it into mass production. Uh, I'll give you a classical example of this. We've also developed uh, from this technology what we call the water fuel cell injector. And basically, uh, this injector now is a miniaturized water fuel cell or miniaturized resonant cavity. And this technology now allows us to simply replace, we can bypass this part of the system's approach and now simply replace the spark plug with the water fuel cell injector and as a result now we can run the water up to the injector which is now being processed and being exposed to a very, very high pulse voltage frequency and as a result as the water fuel is being going into the system then the, the explosion takes place inside the cylinder therefore it makes this an extremely fail safe operable system. Uh, the cord that you see here is strictly hooks up to a very high intensity voltage pulse and we restrict the amps to cause the electrical polarization pro uh, process which in turn the voltage amplitude now takes it and and goes in the ionization state to perform the hydrogen fracturing technology and then in turn the high pulse voltage frequency now allows the ignition of the gases so therefore we do this electronically and so this technology has taken us down to the water fuel cell tech uh, water fuel injector as you see here today which gives us a very economical way of simply converting and running a conventional car or on, on natural water. So basically what we do is we feed ordinary natural water in here, non-processed natural water. We now feed the ambient air gases being ionized. It's being mixed with the water. And then we mix the non-combustible gases going in the system that regulates the control and so allows us now to release the thermal explosive energy from hydrogen and do it on a control means. Further development on the 
on the technology, centered around also the development of what we call the laser accelerator control. And this would had to be developed in order to translate from a mechanical displacement to an electronic uh, displacement in order to allow the hydrogen computer system to produce the gas on demand based on acceleration control. So what you're really seeing with the water fuel cell as it is today is that we have a full system engineering approach allowing us now to use water as a main fuel source to be able to run a conventional engine and run it on water and do it and equal or supersede the performance uh, of a, a car running on gasoline and diesel fuel. Many people uh, do not realize that when you run a car or truck on uh, either gasoline or diesel fuel, you're actually running an, on hydrogen. And all we're doing is using the hydrogen from water. And under the National Bureau of Standards figures shows that when you use water, the energy release is roughly two and a half times more powerful than that of gasoline. So water is a very powerful fuel. And all you needed to do was solve the answers of number one, producing the hydrogen economically, controlling it on demand, being able to adjust the burn rate of hydrogen and gas to co-equal the false of fuels, and the third one was to be able to transport it without spark ignition. And we've solved all of these problems on the design engineering, and of course the water fuel injector, as I've shown you, now gives us the abilities to uh, transport the water directly to the fuel injector, which is now going into the voltage zones, which now is performing the, the electrical polarization process that goes and triggers the hydrogen fracturing technology, but it's doing it inside the engine. So we all know that natural water um, is very stable, and therefore it, it becomes a very fail-safe operable system, as we pointed out earlier. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. So in a system in engineering approach, uh, in mass production, it looks like we can translate and reduce the system's approach down to a unit that costs roughly $1,500 per vehicle. Uh, for trucks, it will be slightly uh, larger than that, uh, below $5,000. It looks like uh, we'll be able to reach the economics to it and use an ordinary natural water. You add n nothing to the water. You don't process the water in any way. Now, here's another uh, feature to the system that everybody asks me about is, is what happens uh, to the water in the wintertime. Does it freeze up? Well, part of our technology was in the areas of development what we call a steam resonator. Now, since the unlike atoms take on opposite electrical charges, we simply use another part of our technology to restrict the angle of voltage to take over, and therefore we agitate the water molecules, which in turn gener generates kinetic energy, which in turn heats the water. Now, this is phenomenal in the fact we consume very little electrical energy in order to heat the water. So uh, there are very far-ranging advantages and features to the technology, ranging even in the areas that we now have a way of using voltage and s s by switching off uh, AMPLO and dealing with um, the environmental control areas, we're developing uh, the technology in the areas of desalination of salt water. Whenever you uh, have a free and abundant energy source like water, uh, it's only limited to the imagination to put it to work. This technology is very applicable to desalination of the salt water, handling of toxic uh, waste uh, chemicals by high pulse voltage frequency and restrict the amps. We now can separate the molecular structure of toxic chemicals and render them uh, useless and safe. It also takes us to the technology uh, of combining unlike atoms that heretofore was not uh, possible under the natural state of covalent link-up. Uh, this led us to the development of the EPG electrical generator technology uh, where we're able to magnif uh, manufacture a magnetized gas that exists at room temperature and enhance the electromagnetic field without increasing mass. So our technology from since the time of the Arab embargo has been very far reaching to give us a comprehensive energy source that we literally can use anywhere into the economies and move in a bilateral movement throughout the economies of the world uh, to bring an energy source in. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, the pending energy crisis that's being uh, will confront us very quickly. Uh, we literally have the ability now of engineering systems engineering it to mass production very very quickly, and hopefully be able to stem off uh, this imminent energy crisis that that is now occurring. A lot of people are not uh, aware of that Kuwait produces or manufactures the majority of aviation fuel for the world, and it's anticipated, uh, as pointed out earlier, that uh, it's possible as much as 20 percent 
drop in aviation fuel uh, may occur within six to eight months. If that happens, then the domino, dominoes effect will occur and will start to trigger uh, an, an energy, system, uh, energy shortage throughout the world. The same conditions that happen in the United States is also occurring in the air fields where the natural pressure in the existing uh, oil fields are dropping. Uh, the only difference between the U.S. and the air fields is their, their pressure is dropping three times faster than occurred in the United States. You just can't keep pulling the oil out of the ground and expect it's going to be there forever. The hourglass effect is occurring at a more uh, faster rate now on nuclear power plants. China's opened the doors to Western technology. 25 percent of the population of the world wants the same goods and services that you and I have been enjoying, and that uh, the industrial base cannot, uh, cannot be maintained or expanded without the supply and utilization of energy, of which we have very little fossil fuel left. So it's imperative that that we developed a technology that we can move very quickly and of course water was the answer to it uh, because water is a very free and abundant energy source and so this technology has led us to the abilities of harnessing and using the water uh, in this particular way which we call the water fuel cell technology. Could you give an indication of the amount of energy stored in a gallon of water compared to a barrel of oil for instance? Yes. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, when you separate the hydrogen and oxygen gases and go into the gas ignition process, uh, its energy uh, releases roughly two and a half times that of gasoline. Now, note the reference is not two and a half times that of fingernail polish, it's two and a half times that of gasoline. But in the hydrogen fracturing technology, we have uh, developed a technology, as the Lord has shown me, that by igniting the hydrogen and oxygen gases and setting up a condition by which the uh, water molecule is prevented to form, then we now can tap into a very, very higher energy yield. And as a result of this, uh, the hydrogen fracturing technology shows that we can release energy up to beyond 2.5 million barrels of oil per gallon of water and do it safely. And uh, as I had shown you earlier, we are now preparing this technology uh, to be retrofitted directly to a jet commander, uh, which we plan not only to fly around the world nonstop uh, around the equator, but turn 90 degrees and go from the North and South Pole. So it's a tremendous amount of energy source. And what we've done is found a, w a triggering process to allow us to release this tremendous amount of energy and do it safely. So it gives us the ability to not only uh, sustain and maintain the economies of the world, but also give us the abilities to uh, handle the environmental pollution problems at the same time. We can't keep putting CO2 in the air and expect that the energy level is going to be there even for our plants. And uh, we all talk about the greenhouse effect, but very few people come up with a viable answer to it. And the water fuel cell technology gives us the ability to get us. Stanley, can you, can you explain the, your driving force behind spending all this money and energy developing something like this? I mean, it's, it's cost you about 10 years of your life. Can you explain why you're doing all this and what really drives you to... Well, I, uh, I did an analysis during the Arab embargo uh, as to what actually occurred. I didn't pay any attention to the political leaders as to why we had an energy problem. And I realized that without a new free and abundant energy source to come into the world economy very quickly, then the world economy uh, could collapse. So uh, as a scientist, uh, I have a very diversified background from research development, product development, engineering, and corporate entrepreneuring. And when I realized uh, the problem that was confronting us, uh, I went into my office laboratory. And as a scientist, I had always uh, believed that there was an existence of God. It was uh, mathematically impossible that we had derived ourselves from swamp gas. If you've got to have a lot of faith, you have, to, you have to have a lot of faith to believe in evolution. And so I went into my office laboratory, and I said, God, I love my country. It's the greatest country in the world. If you'll help me put a power supply in the country, I'll do anything that uh, you want me to do. And subsequently, I was like Paul on, an, on uh, the road to Damascus. I didn't know the Lord, but once uh, he revealed himself to me, uh, subsequently, I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I've been exercising the power and authority of the Word of God, uh, bringing this technology in. And many, many people ask me about, uh, uh, do I fear my life? I have learned uh, the power of angels, and I have been protected in trying to bring this technology in. The ultimate objective is not only to stabilize the economies of the world, but uh, if we realize any funds from the technology, uh, it will go into world evangelization. You see, I, as a scientist, once truth is shown to me, truth is truth. And, of course, I got what I wanted, a ticket to go into heaven. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, as a scientist, uh, truth is truth. And I have a responsibility 
just as I have a responsibility to the water fuel cell technology to try to bring it out into the world, I also have the responsibilities to relate the truth of the Word of God, uh, not only to the guy, uh, to the next door neighbor or the guy down the block, but also relate that truth of that knowledge to uh, every person in the world if I possibly can do it. So the ultimate objective of the water fuel cell technology really is to help set the financial base of capable of evangelizing the world. Now this is, there's a difference between spiritual knowledge and worldly knowledge. And you can't go to the world system and ask them to help evangelize the world and spread the gospel. Uh, but you can go to the world system and give them a cheap uh, power supply that's so economically that will save them economically and then those funds will go into the world evangelization. So uh, the water fuel cell technology, really the ultimate objective is to accomplish the task of evangelizing the world. Uh, by giving the financial abilities to do so. And that's my prime, that's my ultimate and prime objective. Uh, the water fuel cell will give us the abilities to do this. Can you explain, uh, you mentioned one tribal text. You know, uh, well, uh, if you notice on my logo, you'll see Job 38, verse 22 and 23. And this is where the Lord is talking to Job, and he asks Job this question. He says, have you considered the treasures of snow, or have you considered the treasures of hell, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against battle and war? Now, the interpretation of the scriptures are as follows. Is not snow the most beautiful part about water? That no one snowflake looks exactly the same as that of another? The treasures of snow is the characteristic and knowledge of water. The Lord knew that, in fact, that we would have and reach a very critical point in our history that since we won on the dependency of fossil fuels, that, that the flow of fossil fuels uh, may be disrupted. And as a result, the Lord specified that this knowledge of water would come out of time of great trouble. But he also specified that the knowledge would come out prior to two events. Okay, sir. Now that we've, uh, now that you've heard how the thing functions, and you explained your background, why you're working on this thing, uh, what do you think of possible applications? And where do you think this, this device can be applied in what scale and What's the amount of energy we can get out of it? Like you talked before about converting cars, uh, co commercial airplanes. Uh, is there any other application you think of? Oh yes, not only uh, is this technology applicable for all uh, modes of uh, transportation, uh, but it also has application in industrial processes. Uh, during the air embargo, I was called in a meeting in Columbus, Ohio with the industrial leaders, and Columbus Gas System informed us that our gas was being cut off 100%. Uh, what actually were telling us that we were going out of business. And I saw some of the most richest and most powerful industrial leaders of the state popping pills, and I thought they were going to have heart attacks. Because basically, without energy, you can't make a uh, product. If you can't make a product, you can't make profit. If you can't make profits, you cannot pay your bills. So as a result, the bigger you are, the harder you fall, the faster that uh, you would go into economic uh, uh, bankruptcy. So it was imperative that this technology not only be uh, developed for the uh, transportation areas, but also to apply to industrial applications uh, to be able to give energy. Uh, the technology and the hydrogen fracturing technology that gave us the abilities to go in and to protect the military integrity of the Western world. So this technology is applicable not only in, in those areas, but uh, for example, um, during the Arab embargo, uh, our Navy task force uh, did not have the fuel. And so as we have the abilities now to go on the maritime applications, uh, literally run the ships off of water uh, as a main fuel source, and at the same time using the application is cleaning up our environment and pre uh, preventing from the COT and the contaminants uh, that go in the air. So we can move this technology bilateral in every aspect of the economy and do it very, very quickly. And so that, that led us, leads us now into the fact that we have been developing this technology uh, for mass production. And so once uh, we finalize debugging of the pre-engineering unit, then we're going to translate it into a very cost-effective uh, system uh, by taking the technology into microchip technology and plastic mold injection technology allows us now to move this type of technology very quickly. Matter of fact, one master mold uh, set uh, can produce over 11,000 units every 24 hours. That gives us abilities now to move in a bilateral movement, but to get the energy source throughout the entire world quickly, uh, if, uh, if the oil is shut off uh, to us, either by war or by some other methods. Um, a lot of people do not realize Sedan has the uh, viral germ through genetic restructuring, that if he uses it, one, uh, uh, it lives off the bacteria of air and water and even of oil, and if he uses this, 
uh, it's possibly that the oil could be contaminated very quickly. And if that is so, then every country in the world would be faced of shutting off the flow of oil to each of their countries. Now, without the supply of fossil fuels, within 180 to 240 days thereafter, uh, about 1.5 billion people would be facing starvation very, very quickly uh, because we need that flow of energy in order to maintain the industrial basis of the world. So we've designed a technology to be very flexible to use to every segment of the economy and do it very quickly. So we're all in the same boat. And what we're doing is illustrating that, yes, the technology is viable. Here we do have a viable technology that we now can use water as a fuel source because water is a, a very f uh, free and abundant uh, fuel source. But it's going to take you and I and the guy down the street and the people in each country to bring this technology uh, into the marketplace to stabilize our countries. And so as a result, we are uh, developed it uh, under the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, to comply with the law of economics that the guy who comes up the cheapest way is going to win out. So by decentralizing the mass production of the system and, and, the, and the fabrication of the system and decentralize the installation of the system, then we should be able to move in a bilateral movement throughout uh, all the countries of the world to get this type of technology into their countries to stabilize their, their economic base. Uh, if the oil is, is cut off by these means or it simply is being cut off by a lack of supply of oil that is now showing. Uh, it's the same natural pressure that dropped in the airfields, as I pointed out a little earlier, is also occurring in the North Sea. The North Sea uh, pressure has dropped by one-third. So we all need the energy, and so therefore I feel that it's going to take the people of the world to come together and the leaders of, the, of the, each country to come together in one accord in order to allow this type of technology to go on to stabilize their economic basis in each, each respective country. Do you have any time scale for mass production set up yet? And second, do you have any organization or do you planning an organization international? Or? Yes, we are. I'm negotiating with many uh, leaders of different countries of the world. Uh, but the ultimate objective is to mobilize, uh, mobilize the masses of the people uh, in order to bring it in. This is the only way that, that, that can come in. And uh, so as we finalize our debugging of the system uh, and take it into mass production areas, we can do this by simply turning the technology over to many, many uh, fabricators and uh, people who have certain skills uh, in, in the machining areas or mass production areas that will allow this type of technology to be produced very quickly. Okay. Thanks very much for this interview. Oh, my pleasure. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll see you red light. Focus, focus is on okay, go ahead. Stanley, can you give us some idea about the size of a conversion kit for a car, for instance? Uh, we see this, all this electronics sitting there, but I guess this is not going to be part of a future upgrade kit for a car, is it? No, basically what this was a pre-engineering unit in order to satisfy the U.S. Code of Operability on Section uh, 35, Section 101. And it was uh, developed uh, as pre-engineering to uh, show the operability of all the different operational parameters of water fuel cell. But in actuality, the entire technology you see here is really reduced down to the water fuel cell injectors you see right here. But which this, this is the only thing that's needed for upgrading a car, or is there anything else involved? No, uh, the water fuel cell injector, which replaces the, the conventional spark plug in an, in an internal combustion engine, this is hooked up to a water tank. Uh, basically, if you have a, a plastic uh, fuel tank in your car, you simply drain out the, the gasoline, flush it out, fill it up with fresh water. And then then uh, uh, the water fuel cell injector now allows the water to be uh, transferred. Uh, the system approach allows the water to, be, to go in to the injector, which is now being processed to release the thermal explosive energy from hydrogen. The second part that's hooked up to it is what we've referred to here again as the gas processor that's ionizing the gas to allow it to come in. So basically in retrofit all we're doing is simply tapping off the exhaust gases from the conventional engine. We're now using the gas processor to utilize the ambient air to ionize the gases which is now mixing with the water which now converts it to water fuel. We allow the water fuel to go into the, into the injector that's now uh, plugged into our uh, replaces your spark plug and allows the engine now to run off the thermal exposure engine from hydrogen. So basically, all we're doing is taking the gas, uh, gasoline out of the tank, fill it up with water. We now uh, replace the spark plug with the water fuel cell injector, and we now hook a small little miniaturized computer 
which controls the meter mixes the gases going in, in the engine to allow uh, the engine to uh, accelerate and deaccelerate. So the insulation is a quite a very small, lightweight, uh, compact electronic uh, control system. Okay, now the distributor. Is that going to be the same? Can you use the same distributor, or do you have a modified version, or is there anything additional to it? Can you yes, explain we about do. That? We, uh, we do modify the uh, distributor, as it's shown over here. Uh, we simply take off the conventional gas, uh, gas uh, rotor cap out of a conventional engine, and we put the laser distributor uh, in between the, uh, the uh, distributor assembly and the cap, and this now sends the signals to the uh, computer system, which will really be a uh, composite of several IC, IC or integrated circuit chips that miniaturizes the, the hydrogen computer system. Okay. This whole hydrogen stuff, isn't it extremely explosive in the car? Is there any danger involved? What's the safety aspect of all? No, we have actually solved the problem. Uh, there's no storage of hydrogen whatsoever. The water goes into the injector, which now allows it to go into a high pulse voltage zone which performs electrical polarization process. So the water is only converted into thermal explosive energy as it enters the injector. So the thermal explosive energy is now occurring inside the engine. So the electronic system is designed to regulate and control the explosion of the energy, which now co-equals that of gasoline. So it's a tremendously fail-safe operable system. OK, so it's safe. It's a small system. Yes. Uh, what about maintenance of the car engine itself? Uh, do I need more maintenance? Is it different? Um, is there anything? Do I have to modify anything on the maintenance schedule? No, just keep the same uh, maintenance uh, as you, you have it. Uh, since you're releasing thermal explosive energy into the engine and you're co equaling the, the burn rate of gasoline, then there's very little maintenance. Uh, if there is uh, any maintenance at all, uh, we developed the uh, technology years ago that we could really impregnate the cylinder walls. Uh, of the engine with Teflon, and we can even uh, impregnate and treat the bearings and literally run an engine off of, uh, off of the Teflon and eliminate the oil. Uh, if that occurs, then you can use a product, something like Slick 50 in the engine, uh, if you would need it. But the wear factor, since it's a very clean burning fuel, hydrogen is a very clean burning fuel, then uh, the engine uh, oil is not contaminated under the, uh, the old method of running on gasoline or diesel fuel. So it's an extremely uh, clean burning fuel. Are we on? Yeah, the relative temper. Okay, Chris Stanley, what, what about the valves in the engine? The, well, pi the pistons, don't, don't the pistons burn out because there's no lubrication of the, of the lead or any, any other additives to the usual gas? No, the valves you know, have been designed uh, very, very recently to operate off of uh, non-leaded gasoline. And uh, since we use the exhaust gases to cycle back in to modulate uh, the burn rate of hydrogen gas, as we uh, now control the burn rate to co-equal gasoline, then the engine temperature uh, and operations are, are duplicating the same thing on gasoline or diesel fuel. So you don't change the engine in any way. And this allows us now to retrofit the water fuel cell technology to any uh, uh, existing engine. And that's very important because it now gives us the ability uh, that we can stabilize uh, transportation as we talked about before if the energy is cut off. Okay, so now the accelerator. Can they still keep the same mechanical accelerator, or do you have a new device for that as well? Yes, we developed uh, over here as we come along. We've developed the uh, what we call a laser uh, accelerator, as you see right here, that um, simply is attached to the accelerator pedal, and it trans uh, as you press the pedal down, the gas pedal down, it displaces the um, mechanical displacement into electrical impulses, which now is fed into the micro miniaturized uh, computer electronics. So this gives us the abilities now to control the acceleration. This type of technology uh, has given us the abilities to equal or supersede the performance of acceleration and deacceleration on conventional uh, cars that's running on gasoline or diesel fuel. So the, the hydrogen, uh, being two and a half times more powerful than gasoline, uh, gives us a tremendous amount of performance over the prior state of the art. It runs very smoothly, and uh, uh, it, it has a very unusual sensation. Uh, generally, when you're running a, a car on gasoline, you have this kind of a pause. But when you're running on hydrogen the way we're doing it, it's a, it's a constant acceleration. 
So it's a it's a extremely very fast responding uh, fuel source that's coming from water. So, you, so you're claiming that performance is equal or better as a normal gasoline car? Oh yes, definitely. It'll even start up quicker. Uh, in uh, in the winter time, you're dealing with uh, uh, a liquid gasoline or liquid diesel fuel, and you have problems in starting. Uh, in cold weather, you don't freeze uh, you don't freeze uh, gas uh, gas atoms, mm -hmm. and uh, so by Converting the water into instant energy uh, gives us the ability to start the in engine very, very quickly. Well, when you start an engine in the morning, for instance, uh, how long does it take uh, before you can drive away? Oh, it's, it's uh, in an instantaneous startup. Uh, immediately when the pulse voltage frequency hits the, the water, uh, it converts it to the gas, which now produces a thermal explosive energy. So it's an instant, it's an instant uh, type of start. The electronic uh, circuit interfacing gives us uh, the abilities to control and meter the amount of water that's going in on the start condition as, as opposed to on a run condition. So the computer automatically adjusts uh, between the start condition and the, uh, and the run condition. So electronically, we have the abilities to adjust for these parameters. And uh, the same as a conventional car, we also have the abilities to adjust for uh, different ambient uh, air uh, conditions. Uh, going from sea level up into the mountain ranges. So automatically the electronic uh, circuitry design gives us the abilities to adjust these parameters to give us a very smooth operational uh, performance. But uh, what about air pressure? I mean, when you go up high in, in the mountains, you don't use uh, ambient air, so it has no influence on the performance of the car. No, uh, if you come over here, um, Here we have a, a part of uh, a device is a metal bellows, which now allows uh, to control the amount of ambient air going into the engine uh, of the car. And this automatically allows us to regulate uh, the ambient air pressures going from sea level up into the mountain areas. So electronically, these uh, uh, solenoids you see here uh, are, have sensors that automatically uh, senses the amount of ambient air pressures, and they're automatically electronically adjusted to compensate it for difference of air pressure. So this allows us now to give us tremendous good performance uh, going from sea level right on up into the, into the high mountain uh, regions.